but I don't think it, Bitcoin's ever going to be centralized. It's going to be regulated, but never centralized. And I think to the fact that um, as, you, as we started this dialogue earlier, I, like you, believe it, in it as an asset. I own it. I, I, I've never traded it. I'm never going to sell my coin. It's, it's, to me, it's, it's the building I used to own in Boston that I sold for cash. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it, it's, it's something that I think over time will beat the indices and, and hedge me against inflation. It's similar to gold, which I also own, but maybe in a better performing way. And I need to get all the roadblocks out of its way. I, I, I don't want to have this ESG debate about it anymore. I, and I'm part of that debate. I'm, I'm one of the voices that have been saying this now for two years. We've got to address this issue. And again, it came up at the panel I was on today. It's the same story. In that audience, every time I come to these conferences and I do a panel, I look into the audience and I see the same institutions that I serve indexing with baseball bats on hats on and and sunglasses they don't want to be seen here they, they don't want to be seen here but they're really interested in this asset class and in that room i bet you 20 percent of the people today i don't know there are three thousand people in there are involved in financial services there you can tell who they are because they're wearing a hat and they got sunglasses on because they're not ready to declare their players yet, but they want to figure out what are the rules and when will the regulator approve it because it will be allocated. And I think when you're talking about $500 billion sovereign fund and they allocate 1%, you're talking real money. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you as an, 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 an owner of a coin uh, are going to vastly be worth a lot more than before their participation. So what we can have this debate about the community mm. and you know, the moral obligations and centralization, decentralization, but if you were able to get the institutions just a 1% allocation, that's a trillion dollars worth of buying. So now you're talking about a million dollar Bitcoin. That's why I'm in the game. And so I'm happy to have this dialogue saying, mm. everybody wake up and understand, smell the fucking roses. It's there. The opportunity's there. You got to get on the bandwagon to solve this problem for them. And how much issue is there with the regulators right now? Because, again, I, I can reflect on El Salvador, and we just see today that President Bukele announced that anyone invests in the country, they won't have to pay any capital gains tax on their Bitcoin uh, investments. And they just move really quickly as a country. They just make decisions and they move. And we've just seen Ukraine has announced that it's legal to own Bitcoin and it perhaps might become the next one. And we've seen these... Smaller nation, dom smaller nation dominoes falling. Yet here we are in the US where the majority of Bitcoin companies are. I expect the majority of Bitcoin wealth is. Yet it seems like the regulators are doing everything to hold it back. Yeah, no, it's a great observation. L let, me, let me give you the answer from the um, pragmatic view of the big guys, okay? Mm. The guys I get to talk to all the time. Here's the way they look at it. Let's say you're running, I don't know, a hundred billion, all right, and um, your 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 job is to uh, you know work with your compliance department, work with your auditing uh, teams, and then of course report to the regulator in the jurisdiction you're in. Same thing all around the world. For a hundred years, those mandates have had the compliance infrastructure. So let me give you an example. When, here, here in New York, some guy running a billion dollar mandate right now, at 4.01 or a second after four o'clock, the systems will mark to market every position he has or her and say, and it'll go straight to the compliance department and they will see every single position and they, they have the AI to automate it. Let's say the mandate is you can't have more than 20% in any one sector of the S&P and you can't have more than 5% in any one position. That's a classic mandate, okay? If they go offside, even for a second during the trading day, the lights light up in the compliance department because it's a mark to market by the second because they have margin on there sometimes. So whether they buy a bond or whether they buy a stock or you know a, a future or whatever it is, those systems are infrastructure inside. And at 401, the compliance department checks the box, says everything's cool, all right? Then what happens is the auditor, the external auditor can at any time go and check that they're compliant because at the end of the quarter, they're gonna be asked to sign off on the, on the statements as an independent auditor. And those signed off statements then go through the reporting systems to the regulator. Now that infrastructure exists everywhere, in Switzerland, in Germany, in France. That does not exist anywhere for crypto. There is no infrastructure inside of that institution to deal with, okay, 
I'm going to buy $10 million of USDC and I'm going to write contracts for 30, 60, and 90 days on a loan. I'm going to pull in 5.5% interest in paid back in USD and I go back to fiat. You can do that with, you know, Circle if you wished. There is no infrastructure to do that. Where's, who, who operates that structure when, within the traditional so, market? So what happens is if you're a, a you know, XYZ fund company and mm-hmm. you are managing money for institutions like a university or a state, they won't give you a dime until their compliance people go see your system and that you're 100% compliant and you're able to report to them. What's missing in the crypto universe right now is the, the investment in compliance infrastructure so that I can so just I'll give you my example in my own operating company where I have to be compliant. I say, look, um, we just sold that commercial real estate. We've got a lot of cash. Our cash desk says we can only make 21 basis points. I'm going to buy a few million dollars. Let's just start with that. Let's just start with a small amount in the mandate and I'll show you how it works with USDC. The one I like, I like the USDC. I don't do tether. Uh, I don't do die. I use USDC because I love the compliance that's being built over there at Circle. And my, comp- my compliance officer said, no. No, 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 no. no we, we are not doing that. I said, why not? We, because how are we, we going to report that? We have no way to mark to market that. How do we know? We, it's hybrid. It's, it's risky. The answer is no. The answer is no. The answer is no. And I said, no, we got to solve this. We're making, we're not beating inflation on the cash we just brought into the operation. We just sold real estate. And now in, in our mandate, we're losing money every month because we're getting 21 basis points and inflation is 2%. And, and, and our, my own compliance office that I pay that person, I pay them, but their arm's length from me said, no, not doing it. I said, well, I'm going to call the auditor. I call my own auditor and they said, no, not a chance. Are you out of your mind? We're never going to sign those statements. It took me six months to just do the first million. I mean, just to get that as an experiment to just show them it can be done because there's no, there's no infrastructure. And so it's very easy for you and I to just open up a wallet and Mm -hmm. buy stuff. But if you want to play with the big boys, you got to solve this problem. And so that's the noise I'm making. I said it on the panel today. Jeremy was there. Sam was there from you know, FTX. And I got to disclose I'm a spokesperson for FTX and an investor with him now. Mm-hmm. And so and I, I, the reason I did that is I want to use his infrastructure for compliance. I'm, you know, he's got the biggest global infrastructure ever. And, and he, can be, he can be compliant with my own auditors and, and my regulators in the various countries I operate in. So, you know, I, I look at this as a huge opportunity, but... Everybody thinks it, the, it's ready to go. It's not ready to go. It's, it, it, there's, there's much work to be done to make it so that some guy running a, you know, 100 billion says, okay, put 10 billion into, uh, into DAI or put it into uh, USDC just for the overnight and, the no, and not have a, a red light blow up in the compliance department saying, what the hell is that? What is that thing? You're non-compliant, eh, 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 you know, like the phone, yeah. the, the army runs down to his office and shoots him. Like, think, think about that. <laughs> that's what, that, that's yeah. what happened today. And so that's what we're trying to solve for. And, 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 and a lot of people don't understand that opportunity. To me, it's an opportunity. And so when I see these companies emerging, I think we're at 29 billion of USDC now. So there's people playing in it. That's, but that, you know, 29 billion sounds like a lot of money. It's nothing. It's nothing in the, in the global context. I mean, I think it's quite a lot. I know, but trust me, it's, it's not. It's not. It, it makes people think, oh, the institutions are involved. No, they're yeah. not. Yeah. It, it, Let me ask you something, because you talked about in that uh, last moment, you talked about being in inflation. And what inflation number do people like you use? Because we see quoted government inflation, which is around 4 or 5%. Yeah. We see house prices shooting up. I speak to my friends who work in traditional trades, plumbing, carpentry, they're saying their prices are up 10, 15%. Yeah. The house I wanted to buy that I nearly bought last year, I think it's up 20%. How do you, what, what numbers do you guys use for inflation? Yeah, it's a great question because you, you've nailed it there. You've talked about sectoral inflation. And so there's input costs uh, going up in, in, uh, in many sectors, but in real estate for a while, uh, and lumber was going through the roof and, and you know, certain commodities were, were spiking. But Right now, I think the right the way I look at it, when we we, we have a very large cash cash position in my operating company because we reduced our our commercial real estate over the last two years from thirty one percent down to eight. 
So I have to redeploy that. You don't do that overnight, mm -hmm. you know? So we're gonna take crypto up to 7% um, from three. So we're gonna be working on uh, probably 17 to 20 positions in different coin, different token, different chains. We're, we're doing that research now. Why did you reduce your real estate position so much? Um, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a real estate guy from way back and uh, I've lived through three cycles in real estate and you look at cap rates. And okay. so when you see triple A Boston or New York trading in under uh, three and a half cap rate or you know under four even, um, you know you're at the, at the, you're, you're at the top. Now, right. You don't know how long you're at the top, but you're at the top because cap rates are, are crazy, crazy, crazy low in those markets. And the risk you have is if interest rates go up, so do cap rates. And so you can lose 20% real fast. And so, you know, that was one situation. And I also saw what was happening in my, I've got investments in about 34 private companies. I've got commercial kitchens. I've got uh, wireless uh, charging. I've got insecticides. I've got beach chairs. I've got, you name it. And, and you know, I, I do uh, FTA, um, not FTX, but PRX uh, gym equipment. I mean, these are companies that are really successful. And I watched what happened during the pandemic.